It's the Cannon Sports Podcast. On today's episode, we're joined by the head coach of the Thousand Oaks High School football program, Evan Yabu. Welcome in, everybody, to the Cannon Sports Podcast. Today we are at Thousand Oaks High School, the home of the Lancers, and our guest today is the head coach of the Thousand Oaks football program, Coach Evan Yabu. Coach, you- thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Who are you? Please introduce yourself. My name's Evan. Uh, I'm a native of Thousand Oaks. I uh, love ball, love ball, uh, and um, I am really grateful to be sitting in this seat currently. Um, I grew up, like I mentioned, around here. Uh, I played uh, through college, uh, took the long road, went to a JC, uh, Moore Park, transferred to D2 Lane College, and later played a year uh, out in Germany. Got into coaching right away. Uh, started here, actually. Uh, my former head coach, Mike Leibin, hired me as an assistant. And pretty quickly, I figured out that uh, this was like a good fit for for me. And um, since then, it's uh, been a blessing of a journey. Here, here, here we are now, you know. Well, and where we are right now is you guys are 6-0. and First place in the Canyon League. Congratulations. Uh, your next win, uh, hopefully that's going to come this weekend uh, against uh, Camarillo, that's going to tie your total from last year, seven and five, second place finish. That was your second season as head coach of this program. It's been a remarkable, remarkable turnaround in your tenure here. We're going to get into the the details of that later, but specifically talking about this season, like we said, undefeated start to the season. The offense has been held to under 35 points only twice this entire season. The defense three times has allowed a touchdown or less in the game. So through your eyes, what are some of the biggest factors that have led to that start this season? I mean, start, we're already mid season, right? Um, Good players, you know, good players who are committed and focused and consistent, right? Like uh, to perform, you know, well throughout, you know, four, four, five, six weeks, um, there has to be some level of you know habit and routine that's that started to uh, become developed that uh, we've stuck to and again it's big credit to the guys that have you know that have committed to that um, be it extra film hours be it extra work in the weight room be it sticking around practice for a couple of minutes after uh, I can say genuinely that we got great committed. Uh, players who who are bought in want to get into some of those players specifically starting off with chase martin running back linebacker on the offensive end he's got 14 touchdowns and almost 800 yards and on the defensive end leads the team in tackles second in sacks a couple of forced fumbles on on the year i mean this guy is a force talk about him and what he brings to this program wow chase is uh chase is definitely like a generational talent for thousand oaks high school in the last couple, of, <clears throat> excuse me. In the last couple of decades, I don't remember seeing you know too many guys that were this dominant on both sides of the ball like Chase. Um, a lot of that is due to the physical stuff, right? He's fast, you know, GPS tracker, recorded, you know, fast athlete in the games, really powerful uh, in a weight room. You know, you come by any uh, Monday or Tuesday, and you'll see him doing some pretty remarkable stuff. But I think maybe his best attribute is just instincts, right? He's played football since he was a tiny little kid. He's got a super football family. Pops was a coach, player, uh, is a coach currently for us, but was a head coach prior to being here um, and played. His uncles all played college football. So Chase is a football kid through and through. And his instinct and his um, yeah, his, his ability to just, you know, play diagnose has been probably the most impressive. Yeah, and, you know, we talk to a lot of different coaches on this show from several different schools, and they're all different. Some of them are bigger, some of them are smaller, some of them are public, some of them are private. And one thing that has come up is when we talk about guys, when we talk about guys like Chase who are really dominant on both ends of the ball, two-way players, that's something that's you know, the, the coaches of the smaller schools, the public schools with smaller rosters talk about really a need for those kinds of guys to excel because you don't necessarily have the same number of specialists uh, as the as the larger schools. But that said, not everybody has that guy. The fact that you do, how much of an advantage is that for your program? Oh, it's it's definitely I mean, just having Chase is an advantage, period. Right. Um but I, you know, to those guys' points, right? It is really tricky, even still for Chase, uh, 
to stay fresh, right? Monitoring those workloads is something that we do our best to um, put an emphasis on through the course of the week in practice. And then when we get into a game, even uh, still, you know, we're, we're doing our best to, you know, give them two or three plays uh, where we can and let them get fresh and, and, and come back. So, you know, to that, I guess to that point, you know, it's, it's, making sure that we're monitoring the workloads at practice and also making sure that Chase is empty in the tank over and over again at practice so that he can come back and, and do that in games. Yeah, and he's certainly not the only offensive star you guys have. Your quarterback, Travis Endicott, he's been great in his senior year coming over from Newberry Park, or you guys just beat in a double overtime thriller a couple of weeks ago. Travis has 220 yards a game, 15 touchdowns, uh, opposite just two interceptions, and he's got a pretty good supporting cast of wide receivers to, to throw to as well. Most definitely. Travis has been a super blessing to our program. Uh, transferred over... Uh, in January of this year and coming from a rival school, you never know how a guy's going to fit in right when he pops up and we just got done playing them tough in a tight one last year. Um, so he showed up and uh, to his credit was just a consistent grinder weight room, really weight room and in, in, in the running in the offseason was a worker. And I think I got a lot of guys to, um, to buy into him and respect him through his ethic of work. And um, the, the, achievements on the field come to no surprise to the people that have been around him for the last couple of months moving over the defense we talked about what chase martin's uh, been capable of on the defensive end your uh your corners silas kemp will halib they've got three interceptions apiece on the year uh in that in that game i think they both uh picked off brady smigel in that newberry park game i mean that's a that, that's an accomplishment in its own right guy had zero interceptions coming into coming into that game you guys picked them off four times a couple of them were were those guys that uh, that i just mentioned and they've been rock solid all year as well they most definitely have you know those two silas will and then uh, specifically you know dean harrington and sam shapiro the, those four guys in addition to chase um they're guys that are consistently doing a little bit extra, right? We all, the five of us actually meet uh, at least once a week for, you know, a good half an hour or so and, and go through, you know, top concepts, um, down and distance uh, tendencies. And uh, the extra work definitely, I think, is starting to show on the field a little bit. Um, one of the strengths, I would say, of the defensive unit, starting with those five guys, is communication. And if you get down onto one of our practice fields and just watch us go on a Wednesday or a Tuesday, you'll see that those guys are chirping to each other the whole the whole period, all the group periods, you know, they're, you know, alert this, uh, they're talking to the corners, the corners are talking back to them, they're echoing down to the to the uh, the box players. So um, thankful to have that group kind of heading the secondary. Now, that communication element, how is that something that you're able to foster? Obviously, raw football talent, a lot of that is God-given. And yes, of course, there's some things that you can do in the weight room and extra reps in practice to get a little bit of an edge on on that front. But communication, that's that's not something you're born with. That's something that you have to foster. That's something that you have to create. And clearly, from what you're telling me right now, you guys have done a great job of 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 doing that and my question is how in february we hired a good buddy of mine matt coleman is his name and um he introduced a holistic health program to our athletes right it started off with a small collection of guys that we deemed to be leadership types and then that extended out into the entire team every every week for about five months you know those guys had at least one meeting with matt and those meetings ranged from talking about um, your spiritual health, your emotional quotient, uh, to your um, your your diet, your nutrition. Um, and in those uh, in those seminars, we did a lot of public speaking. And those guys have all been up on the stage in front of everybody, talking about something that makes them genuinely uncomfortable at least once. A lot of them multiple times. So not even having pertaining to football no nothing no football at all all stuff that they're uncomfortable speaking about specifically and uh because of that like you get into a room with the with the guys like into our meeting room and they are just they're just non-stop they just talk a lot you know what i mean and listen a lot too they fostered those two qualities i think through matt's holistic program really well listening um uh, with the intent to you know to obtain and then um speaking openly so what's like what's like the format of uh, of the speaking i remember when i was in high school i did speech and debate and you know we had to come up with a 10 minute speech on a topic of our choosing it could be 
something something that we knew, something advocating for something in the in the political sphere, you know, whatever. What's kind of the the format of the of these topics that they speak on? Uh, they're all different, right? One of them was I remember we were in the performing arts center. One guy is walking up onto stage. The whole the whole program sitting in the audience, and there's a panel of a couple guys sitting at a table, and the one guy had to. Um, basically simulate being interviewed, you know, by the guys at the panel and he's having to talk about, you know, his, his, his best attributes in front of the entire program and things that they need to work on in front of the entire program sitting in this huge performing arts center. Everybody's in the audience. That's an example. We did some seminars out on the field where every single person would walk up, get on the microphone and mostly talk about like areas of growth and stuff that they feel like that, um, maybe has hindered them through their, you know, through their young, uh, teen years. So and it's personal topics. Very personal. Yeah. They've all gone deep, you know, inside, um, you know, to themselves, right? We do a lot of like handout worksheet type stuff, but then in front of their peers is what we really try to focus on just because we feel like the high school climate right now is so loaded with, um, you know, youth that are like massively concerned about what other people think about them. Yeah. And, and that's huge, you know, as much as, Obviously, you know yourself better than better than any other topic, but that doesn't mean it's easy to talk about yourself, especially in those personal, sensitive areas of self improvement and growth. And I'm sure that uh, that that you realize, and I'm sure that they're starting to realize that's going to have massive benefits beyond even their football playing careers. There's no doubt, even like especially football specifically, right? Miss super macho. We got to be tough. We got to be hard. You know these hard nosed. You know, it, it doesn't get touched on quite a bit, I think, in this sport. So we try to take a different approach in that. Like, we meditate before the games and stuff. And what effect has you, have you found uh, that that's had? Uh, the ability to drop into focus, right? Like, to be able to control the focus climate. Um, when we go eyes closed and we come back into our breath and, you know, we spend two minutes just breathing and trying to clear some space in our heads, it's like when their eyes open, everyone's just snapped in and they're, you know, it's like, well, you get another level of attentiveness and focus. And through that, you know, we try and take that skill and reference it in the games. You know what I mean? Hey, come back to the breath, take a second and, you know, let's go. And it's, I, th I think it's working. Now, these these tactics, holistic health, meditation, they're not necessarily things that are top of mind when you first think of the hard nosed football atmosphere but you've been doing it and you've been having great success with it did it all seem like a leap when you first started to to implement those types of things with your team yeah i would say so i think it definitely felt like a leap um but it, it, you know that journey like on an individual level always starts with a leap right like for me personally when i took that first step into you know trying to self discover a little bit and take a look inside i mean that's what it started with right you go you know what I, you know, I, I, there's more to this. I need to, I, I need to do some, some work and, um, inevitably, right. You take on that same challenge with like a hundred kids, hundred, you know, teens. It's like, we'll see if they'll buy into this, but to their, to their credit, you know, they have. So it's something that you had personal experience with and something that had benefits for you before you try to implement it on a larger scale. Most definitely. Yeah. Most definitely like, uh, becoming present, I think is like maybe like the, or if, there's, there's no level of perfect, perfecting that, right? Like inevitably we're still going to be in our heads sometimes and worrying about the future or the past, but putting some focus on, on becoming present and, and being where you're at, I think on an individual level impacted me so significantly that it felt like something that I would be wrong for not like trying to at least put in these guys' minds a little bit. Well, and so I want to skip ahead a little bit. Um, you know, so you, got this job prior to the age of 30. And I'm wondering if these uh, tactics that you're bringing to your program that are somewhat new age, they're not, you know, long standing, time tested, decades old coaching uh, strategies and traditions. Does your youth relative to your coaching peers uh, in this industry kind of lend that lend itself to being more open to trying these new things and having these kinds of results? It's a good question. I, I would think the youth probably has its pros and cons, right? The the main con I find in football is just like experience, right? Like every every corner, 
it feels like we turn or I turn. I'm discovering something that I'm like, man, if I had, you know, if I had two more years of experience, I'd have seen that coming. But um, the pros definitely, I think, outweigh the cons, right? Like just the simple ability to relate to the players a little bit more, I think is a, I think is a pro. Um, and then in terms of seeing what's out there on the, on the cutting edge of technology tactics, um, stuff like, I guess what we're talking about, like the whole person, right? I think that stuff lends, lends an advantage for sure. So without necessarily giving away any, uh, any trade secrets, what are some of those other things that, as a, you know, as an early thirties coach, you're more in tune with, you're more on top of than maybe somebody who's been so deeply entrenched in doing it the way that they've been doing it for the past couple of decades. I would say probably the number one thing is monitoring workloads, football and really society, in my opinion, in today, like glorifies the overworker, right? Ah, Man, I've been grinding 14 hour work day today. I'm just gassed. And it's like we're pre-programmed to believe that that's how like life is supposed to be. Like the guys that we should respect the most are the ones that can work for tirelessly for so long and not complain about it that um, that they you know just have a higher you know capacity than everybody. And I think what the what the front end of science is telling us right now from like a, a sports performance perspective is that. Uh, it's impossible to perform your best or output at your most without like supreme levels of like rest, w- hormone regulation, and you know not o- overworking guys. So I'd say like our practices are short, like compared to most probably. The amount that our guys go at practice is again pretty regulated. I think we're one of the first in high school to be using our, our entire varsity program where's gps trackers and that's pretty uncommon i'd say at the high school level what's the purpose of the gps trackers you're getting uh, metrics like you know total yardage in a in a day or in a game you're getting the amount of sprint volume you're getting the max velocity rate you're getting the top and you know um, max uh, velocity for the day you're getting deceleration counts and rates so you're getting metrics that you know we can look at and go a, okay, our whole program measured up next to each other. Who are the guys that are just simply no no feelings involved? Who's moving the best? And then B, what climate is what climate in terms of what climates can we help create to make them move their best, right? Like if Chase for example can run 21 miles an hour on a Monday after 2 days of rest, on Tuesday, we know that he's not hitting 21, right? Like if Chase can cruise at a 19 and a half on Tuesday, but still touch a, you know, a fairly high velocity, that's a good day. So you're really in touch with the analytics aspect of the game as well. Trying, yeah. There's, you know, it's it's forever changing and there's more coming out every second, it feels like, but we do our best to stay in front of it. Yeah, well, and, you know, like we said, we, we, we talked about uh, the results so far this season, the results last season but you know putting that in comparison to the couple of seasons prior to to your arrival this team went 0 and 10 in back-to-back years prior to to you showing up so it sure sounds like the 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 new atmosphere the the culture the training the tactics that you've brought are really having a a positive effect so so congratulations on that thank you i appreciate it so getting into a little bit of your playing career uh, you were an alum of this program, and actually, before we get into that, um, being an alum of this program, how special is it to have your first head coaching opportunity be at your alma mater? All time special. I uh, couldn't have dreamed of it of it working out any better. Yeah, and actually, you know, one one more thing that I want to get into is, you know, we talked about uh, the specific players on the team, but I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the green hole the the student section and let me tell you we were at your game against Newberry Park and the green hole they were raucous man they were one of the best fan atmospheres that that I've seen at a high school football game so far this season uh and it really does make a difference you know we see it from the high school level to the college level up through you know Seattle the 12th man they're 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 famous it really does make a difference so you know talk about the uh the 
the atmosphere that that they bring and really the advantage that that provides this program beyond what anybody's doing on the field. Right. Like atmosphere wise, it almost feels sometimes like we're in a small college type setting, right? When they get rocking, like against Westlake at home, it was crazy in there prior to, you know, the Newberry setting, which I think was probably one of the most packed houses that, you know, at least I've seen in some years, uh, maybe ever for me. But you know, like the Westlake game, man, these guys were, I mean, they were ruthless. Every time Westlake would grab some momentum, it was like the green hole would suck it back out of them. And, you know, I'm, what I'm seeing is around, like, locally, a lot of other fan sections starting to pick up. And, you know, now they, there's some that got names and stuff. But I'm telling you, back 15 years ago when I was, you know, on this campus, like, the green hole was this popping then. And they're a legendary student section without question. So for all the ones that are that are coming up and getting more notoriety, the Green Hole is, is kind of the the OGs of yes. the student sections down here. Yes, they've been here. Yeah. So who are in 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 your time so far? Who are some of the other more uh, raucous opposing student sections that you have had? Shall we say the uh, the pleasure of uh, of visiting? Man, Westlake and Newberry. They bring it against us, you know, to those, their student sections. So those two, I would say, stand out as they were. They were great. They they both brought it. So both of them. Any uh, any chants or taunts in in particular that stuck out to you that that you're able to share on this show? The new in Newberry, it was the parents. I want to say the parents started going, "You're in trouble." After the parents, uh, yeah. After <laughs> Newberry had picked up some momentum, and that stuck. That one I remember. I was remembering the game like, "Ooh, you know, okay, they're they're bringing it." So their student section and their their parents, they brought it. Newberries, they brought it. Yeah, they all they all get after it. Right. All right. Now I want to get into uh, to your playing career. So you graduated from here in 2007, like we said. Uh, you were you were like like Chase, a two way player. Uh, your senior year, I believe you won team MVP. Is that right? I did. 2008, my it was my class, but 2007 season. Yeah. That's right. Okay, yeah. and a winning record here. Each year that you played, a couple of deep postseason runs during your time. Now, you know, drawing on that, you know, we talked about uh, the the success of the program during your time as a coach and immediately before that. What were you able to draw upon during your time as a player here at Thousand Oaks when you ultimately took the job? As a player at Thousand Oaks, I would say I, I remember a winning tradition and a winning expectation like as a player being here i remember you know when i first uh, got to the high school really looking up to the older guys and feeling like there was a standard that we kind of that we had to meet and in terms of how that has like um how that's translated into maybe some coaching philosophy i would say for me personally right like the the that doesn't tell my full story i'd say uh in terms of where the philosophy comes from right after i played at thousand oaks i people a lot of people don't know i started facing like a lot of playing adversity right? i was a football crazy football crazy young person like you know uh, the guy that would miss social stuff to be like working out. So I loved ball like nothing else. My true freshman year, you know, tore, tore a shoulder labrum in the first game, missed that whole season. And then as a red shirt freshman and as a red shirt sophomore, as a red shirt freshman at Moore Park, I go 0 and 10. Okay. And then as a red shirt sophomore, my first year at Lane College, we go 0 and 10. So that's a part of my, you know, my story that I think has, um, impacted me really significantly maybe more so than the winning seasons and being a part of those those winning cultures was being owned I was owned 10 twice you know as a player and you know you remember a lot about those years the way it stung the way a lot of your peers questioned their love for the game and that following season at Lane we went four and six and it was like the most wins that Lane had had in you know, some significant period of time and I remember those victories feeling so like so amazing you know we had this bell at lane that we would go ring in front of uh, on the campus and i remember ringing the bell and just being like ah oh, like it's been three years since i won a game this you know it meant so much and um i think because of that right like when, when we got here and we took over and uh, the program had been down there was a lot of a lot of things that i felt like we could relate to and um, ultimately, the the 
all those experiences, not just mine, obviously all the other coaches, which a ton of great ones that have been a part of this uh, with me, um, those experiences, though, I think in the collective have all kind of unfolded into where we're at now. And so what's the message when you when you come from when you come from that kind of program that has been down and you get those first couple of wins and you know I think it was four and six that you said mm-hmm. so not not even a 500 season but comparatively huge strides so what's the message when you're leading or as a player being a part of that kind of rebuild is it be patient trust the process kind of like my personal philosophy is like win moments like win moments don't win the day don't win the you know the week like win the win moments win reps like progress happens in moments like step by step rep by rep and when the big picture is so out of whack right like you've been whatever you're going through losing seasons the culture in your locker rooms jacked up Really, I I do believe you cannot fix all of it in any one splash, but you've got to put together some small wins over, you know, and sustain it, you know what I mean, over small periods of time and build a habit out of winning the moments. And then I think you start to see the tide turn. And yeah, that's my that's my collective message. You ever see the movie The Martian? I haven't. Phenomenal movie. Matt Damon's stranded on Mars. Trust me, I'm going somewhere with this. Okay. It'll make sense. Okay. And there's a great line at the end where he's talking about how, you know, when when you're out there in space, everything goes downhill. You have two options. You either accept it or you get to work. And the line at the end is you solve one problem, then another, then another, then another. And if you solve enough problems, then you get to go home. And that sounds a lot like what, what you're talking about. Exactly. Yeah, and it really does it really does take an entire shift in mindset to to turn around a, a team like that. It's not just talent on the field, but you know, you've been able to to amass both and 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 the results have, have definitely shown. So um moving on from there, you know, we talked about your time here at Thousand Oaks and Moore Park and Lane. I want to get into your time in Germany. I mean, you said you love ball and let me tell you, it, it must take some love of ball to, to travel all the way to, to Germany for, for a playing opportunity. Tell us about uh, about your time there and how that opportunity came to be. Wow. That, the time in, in Germany, specifically first in Feldbrook, was magical. Uh, it came to be... First in Feldbrook. Yeah, first in Feldbrook. Short, they call it firsty. The firsty Razorbacks. And it's about... 20 miles outside of Munich, right? Yep, about 20 miles uh, north of Munich. Beautiful city, beautiful location, amazing people. It was a magical experience. I would recommend it to any guy that's coming out of college that, um, you know, maybe is having trouble getting picked up in like the CFL or or in the league and, they you know, they're maybe not done playing and they're looking for some life experience. Like, I can't say enough good things about it. Like, the 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 people just learning about a new culture and then their scope on football is a lot different than here. I'd say it's a lot like less stressful, you know, it's not like this meticulous, you know, game planning and, and crazy discipline. Like it was guys smoking cigarettes on bus stops and (laughs) come, yeah, coming, you know, coming home from work at 6 PM, changing out of their work boots to come out onto the practice field. And, uh, it was, it was amazing. I can't say enough good things about it. But it's still a full-on competitive professional football league. Oh yeah, when they get to and when it's game time, I mean they're banging and they're serious and there's massive dudes out there, massive. So it's still very serious. So who what what's the makeup of the league itself? Who plays there? You know, you had a player like you, some community college experience, D two experience. Right. Who were you playing with and against? I was playing with one of my my great bros, Ian Schultes, who was a quarterback at UMass. Uh, we played against guys that had similar uh, similar backgrounds, guys that played, but not just you know Division two football. Like there was guys that we played a linebacker that had uh, had played at like Michigan. Um, there were guys that had played really all over the U.S. some some college level. There were guys that we played out there that were like. I remember I was like 24 and I remember we played a guy that had been there for like 
eight years or 10 years. He's like 30, 35, I want to say. And he played some small school football in, you know, in America, I think D3 ball somewhere. And he just stuck around and, and, and loved it. So did you find that most of the players were American, German? Oh, gotcha. Each team has, each team can have three Americans total on the roster, two on the field at any one given time. So mostly, uh, mostly Germans. Oh wow! So it's so it's vast majority German. Vast majority, yeah. Any other countries represented there? Yes, yeah, yeah. There'd be guys like, oh yeah, we just got this guy that came in from you know like Austria. They have a pretty they have pretty good football in Austria. Italy they play, Switzerland they play. So there's a couple countries up there in um, yeah, in in, in Europe that that really take ball seriously, and guys would you know move around and play as their as their lives took them in different directions. What are some of the biggest differences that you found uh, between? that and the american football experience here in the states i mean were there were there different were there different rules to the game or was it pretty much the same game as here pretty much the same game i think the biggest difference is just like the com- the the weekly commitment right like the two practices a week uh really three after we'd have like a walkthrough one day but you know two and a half practices a week in a game on sundays you know we have you know we'd have days off like it was it was really cool well you were telling me before the show about uh, how a lot of these guys they would have Full on day jobs and then show up to the field in the evening to practice. Yeah, I'm telling you, full full on show up in the evening to practice. Practice ends. People are pouring, you know, pouring beers at the field and sitting around socializing. It was a very like, it was a very um, community like family family climate that was also like here like rich with tradition. So, what did you do in in your downtime when you were out there for that year? We traveled. Uh, we made a lot of close friends, you know, and, and I was pretty young. I was 24. So, I mean, we did what young people do. You know, we were out quite a bit, but mostly traveling. Like anytime we would have an extended, you know, two or three day period, like we're in the car mobbing to other parts of Germany, Amsterdam, through Italy, you know, into like Prague. We went all over the place when we were out there. Yeah, and that's really one of the coolest things I would imagine about uh, about the international game, whether it be football or any sport, is the ability to travel and see all of these places and experience new cultures that you otherwise uh, wouldn't get to. I mean, I know through through my own work experience, I've had that, you know, just working all across the United States. I think football is just like that period, you know. Dep- it doesn't matter where you're at. Like you're playing you're playing college football in America somewhere. You're in a locker room with guys from California, Florida, the East Coast, the Midwest, and inevitably you just start meeting people from all over the place. Um, like even Lane for me was like totally was you know I, I met people from regions of the United States where I knew nobody, and now I got all these people all over the South and you know in Tennessee and in Atlanta and Florida, and in Europe it was the same way, right? Was, you're meeting people that live, you know, that live different than you, and I think that might be the the number one you know, most valuable thing that football has brought into at least my life personally is just perspective and meeting people from other places. So what were some of your biggest takeaways having had that experience and, you know, meeting all of those people who live that different way and come from that different culture? I think one of my biggest takeaways, and I, you know, I don't mean this to sound negative, but I think a lot of people, you know, look through life, you know, through just their lens, you know, and, uh, or look at life through just their lens. And I feel like, you know, unless you're challenged to, you know, to jump outside of your perspective and think about how somebody else may think of something. I mean, you know, if you're not challenged to do that, you may never do that. Right. So I think that would be my biggest takeaway is, you know, learning that there's other ways to see the the same thing. Right. And, um, yeah, taught, taught me a lot. Yeah. And I'm sure that that's a message that you, that you impart onto your players here. Uh, do, do our best, right? But there's still a lot of them, you know, not all of them. We've got a player that's from Germany, actually. We've got guys that moved have moved from Kentucky and all over the place. But, you know, a lot of these guys, you know, growing up in Thousand Oaks, live in Thousand Oaks their whole life, all they know is Thousand Oaks. So we do our best to try, try and help those guys out. So you said that there are teams and leagues all throughout Europe, not just Germany. How big is the appetite for American football in that part of the world? Growing. Yeah, it's big. It, it's big and getting only bigger. Um, they actually have a lot of difficulty in growing the game through just like stuff that you would never imagine, like, like getting equipment, you know, like when I I remember when we were coming out there, they were like, you know, can you throw some shoulder pads in your suitcase and can you bring some helmets and stuff over there? And even just last week I was talking to a buddy that was like, Hey, you know, 
it, when you come out and uh, I'm supposed to go out in December uh, for a honeymoon. Just got married in April. Shout out to my wife, Rajani. Um, he asked me to bring him some cleats and stuff. So it's growing and I only see it getting bigger. So, you know, every year the NFL plays its London game. And I feel like for the past decade plus, we've been hearing about, you know, they're going to move a team to London. Maybe it'll be the Jaguars. Maybe it'll be somebody else. And it hasn't happened. Although the London game, you know, it's a, it's, it's a draw. People watch it. People go to it. It's popular. Do you think we'll ever see the NFL in Europe? Ooh, that's a great question that I can't say that I, that I know the answer to. If I had to guess, I would think that at some point football on an international level has to grow. I think, you know, I just think there's too much money in the in the in the football business for it not to expand like soccer has not expanded. Soccer's always been, you know, all over the place, but yeah, for football to not be big like it is in America and a lot of other countries is surprising to me. So I think it, it will grow. Yeah, I guess really the biggest problem with the NFL specifically is just the logistics of travel. You know, if you put a team in London, how do you coordinate having back-to-back road games? Right. Play a game in Vegas is like a, that's like a 16-hour flight. Yeah, and yeah. then you got to fly back. Right. And then maybe fly out somewhere else the next week. Right, right. All right, so perhaps maybe, uh, maybe an easier question than is the NFL coming to Europe. Um, so we see in baseball and basketball, there's a lot of crossover, but, uh, not necessarily crossover, but international leagues as a developmental feeder to American teams. You know, we see all the time star players in uh, European basketball coming over to the United States to play in the NBA and, you know, and playing very well. You know, a lot of these guys are superstars, Luka Doncic among, you know, several mm-hmm. countless others same thing with baseball plenty of guys from cuba and other places in latin america japan korea they come out and they get time and and they sign massive contracts in the united states to become all-stars in their own right football we don't really see that what are some of the barriers to having some of these european league service feeders to american football and you know what are some of, what are some of the things that uh, that need to happen to make that a viable option? Do you think? I think the only thing that keeps that from happening is like the farm system starting when you're a kid, right? Like when when if you look at a lot of the top football players in America, you know a lot of them a started playing football when they were really young, or b you know played another sport that directly. I guess, assists in the development of football athletes, be it running track or I suppose playing soccer, which they could do in America. But I guess long and short is that's what you don't see out there is kids at a really young age training to become football players, learning how to move like football players and developing the skills to be, you know, elite, elite football athletes. So I think once they start taking it really, really serious on the youth level and get, you know, um, maybe more advanced in like the way that they teach young people it it will turn into a feeder and there are some guys that have come over like from firsty from from um where where i played that are at the division one level here and and making strides to be in the nfl so i i think it'll start to develop well before we bring it back stateside what uh what do you think will be the ultimate trajectory of football overseas i think uh like i mentioned earlier i think the long play is football grows internationally and becomes big, I don't know about America big, but becomes big in multiple other countries. Yeah. All right, so bringing it, up, bringing it back stateside, I want to touch on a claim that you made before the show. You said that Thousand Oaks is a hotbed of very good football talent. Explain. Maybe not football talent, but just football, right? Like there's so many different uh, parts of the football ecosystem that exists in Thousand Oaks or at least, you know, r- relatively close to Thousand Oaks that, you know, sometimes I sit back and marvel like, man, it, it really is crazy how much, you know, how much good ball there is right around us. The Rams practice less than a mile away and inevitably, um, you know, when they're in season, you don't see them much. But in the off season, like these guys are out here on local high school fields, you know, they're working out and they're in local training facilities working out. So, you know, they're all over the place. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, really top notch training facilities, you know, within 10 square miles of here. Uh, example would be like proactive sports over in uh, West like Agora Hills. That's, you know, every year these guys got three, four dozen, you know, 
top tier professionals that are training with them for multiple months at a time. You've got Division Three Cal Lutheran down the street. You've got you know three junior colleges within you know 25 miles of us four within you know within 35 miles so there's just a lot of ball you know there's a lot of schools around here there's a lot of people that come back in the off season uh at like you know the college level and, and come back and train in thousand oaks or in you know the surrounding areas so you know this conejo valley i just think is a hot uh hotbed area for football the game and and the people that are um that are deeply involved in it with all of those guys, you know, the Rams specifically being so close, I know you said that uh, that that you work out with some of those guys or, uh, or or at those facilities. Does your does your program ever ever interact with with anybody on those levels? Most definitely. Yeah, the the program definitely does. Last night at our practice, we have a, a in a from Thousand Oaks six year NFL veteran, Dave Anderson. He played for like mostly most notably for like the Texans with Andre Johnson and Arian Foster and those guys. He was out here with his Texans helmet on last night running, routing our guys up um, with Richard Mullaney, who's an alum here, played for played, you know, on the 2016, you know, championship team for Bama and and had stints in in the league and in Canada. And and then like last night, Dave brought Alex Mack, who's a 13 year all pro center, you know, pro bowler. And he's just like in our inside run period, pulling, you know, pulling our guys over and and giving them, you know, tech tidbits in the middle of practice. Uh, which I thought was really cool. But I guess to answer your question in short, yeah, they're around, really around. That's got to be a thrill for for your guys to be able to kind of just soak everything in from you know, guys who played at, at the level that all of these guys, I'm sure, aspire to be at. Right. I mean, I think, I, I hope that they don't take that for granted, right? I think they're a little bit spoiled because, you know, Alex Singleton, who's, you know, like our notable, our current NFL alumni He's in the league now. You know what I mean? He's playing for the Broncos now. And the seniors in our program, they don't know anything other than, like, Alex as, like, being one of their coaches. He's He's been in, involved with the program deeply from day one. So when he's around sometimes, I'm like, you guys realize that, you know, this guy has a, a job that pays him, you know, over a million dollars to to – to do something but when he has downtime he, he's not like a guy that drops in and like you know he says what's up and takes off in 15 minutes like he's calling me in the morning what time what time is practice you know what are we so we're hitting you know we're hitting cover three today are we get, like he's involved in the practice planning always here he's involved in the weightlifting he's involved in uh, everything so i hope our guys don't take for granted getting a chance to work with those types of guys because alex has spoiled them but um i think they're pretty lucky well what does that say about guys like Alex, who, you know, certainly, you know, certainly not doing it for money. You know, he's got his own, he's got his own thing going on outside of here. But what does it say about guys like him who are willing to spend their downtime coming to, uh, to a place like Thousand Oaks High School and be willing to, to give, to, to, get, to, give yeah, right. to give their expertise to the next generation? Right. I mean, it says just that, like these guys are just, you know, Alex specifically, like a selfless dude who's cut from that cloth of like, you know, hardworking family, um, was never handed anything, appreciates like the mentors he's had in his life and, and what football has provided him and literally like gives it back, you know? So it says about those guys that, you know, this world is, uh, despite, you know, its problems is still, you know, has a lot of great, great people in it who are givers and, and don't ask for anything in return. Yeah. And that's what every, that's what every, person needs every athlete every program somebody willing to to be that mentor be that guide for the next generation and i hope that that uh, pays dividends with this program and i hope that when these players have the opportunity to pay it forward they will i do too i I do too. All right. Well, that seems like a great place to end for today. Coach Evan Yabu, thank you so much for joining us on the Canon Sports Podcast. Thank you so much for having me, man. That was a blast. I want to wish you the best of luck the remainder of this season. I want to thank all of our viewers and listeners for tuning in, and we will see you next time. Thanks for tuning in. Make sure to subscribe and follow on Instagram at Canon Sports, TikTok at Canon Sports Official, and of course, canonsports.com for all your sporting goods needs.